When Megatron says, Here we are. Fight us now. His wheels glitch through Abraham Lincoln's chair. In many scenes, it is obvious that the medium fighter that Bumblebee hijacks is a prop. Wouldn't it be much more efficient to have Transformers rebuilding Cybertron instead of humans? Possibly because the Cybertronian Civil War turned the planet into a barren wasteland, it possible the population was decreased or scattered across the universe. It was lack of manpower that they needed billions of humans to rebuild Cybertron. It's also possible that the plot of building an army from the first movie was tied into the Sentinel Megatron Alliance, to have the army be the labor force to rebuild with Earth's resources. The personal jet inside the space center has the identity number, 4500X, the same number as Blackout's helicopter form. It also has an Autobot logo on. Silverbolt was supposed to be a confirmed character, this could be him. Sentinel Prime claims to use humans to rebuild the planet. However, after arriving Chicago, they start a massacre on the civilian populace. While there are possible answers of various likelihood, the inconsistency is unexplained. The Decepticons needed to assert their authority over Earth, as well as establish a secure base of operations, devoid of any possible internal threats. Besides, they have the rest of the planet full of humans. Killing of Chicago citizens wouldn't really have much affect. Megatron and Soundwave ordered Laserbeak to kill off all Decepticon human collaborators with Dylan an exception because of his undying loyalty to their cause. However, his assistant, the old lady, his friend, the man who said, he, s young, he'll learn, and shook hands with him and is credited as Dylan Gold's executive, and his bodyguards are also human collaborators, and weren't killed off. Dylan's right-hand woman and friend's fate weren't even revealed after the party, nor after the Battle of Chicago, and all the bodyguards are killed when Bumblebee opened fire at the penthouse as revenge for Dylan kidnapping Carly so he could marry her. Even so, Soundwave said, Laserbeak, kill them all. It's possible that Dylan's assistant and friend weren't killed off because they both, much like him, are also loyal to Decepticon cause, and that the bodyguards weren't killed off before Bumblebee did it at the penthouse because of their usefulness at helping Dylan in his role as the Decepticon's human ally. Since everyone from the government knew that Dylan was in league with the Decepticons thanks to Simmons telling about him hiding himself in Chicago, it could be possible that his assistant and friend were arrested for their crimes in the aftermath of the battle. All the members of Dylan's house staff and all the employees from his company and the building that was used as the Decepticon's base of operations in Chicago were working for him and followed the orders to put out the space bridge pillars. Just because someone such as a butler or a maid works for the antagonist doesn't mean they're also evil. It could be possible that Dylan's house staff and everyone on the party knew about his affiliation, but couldn't do anything because they were possibly threatened to remain quiet. Even his friend's wife, who for some reason is credited as Dylan Gold's assistant when it's obvious that she doesn't work for him, was looking with disdain when her husband said those words about Sam and shook hands with Dylan, showcasing she didn't like working for the Decepticons one bit. Many party guests were driving out of the estate when Soundwave revealed himself because they probably knew they weren't capable of doing anything to help Sam and Carly, and some of his staff stayed inside of the mansion, with some spying from the windows because they were scared. Even some butlers stand still outside to see at the revelation happening because they have the guts to see something horrible like that, but much didn't like it. Simply put, they all knew the truth but couldn't do anything because of the Decepticons, their boss, his right-hand woman, his friend, and his henchmen, causing all of them to work against their will, and were finally free when the Battle of Chicago was over. Sentinel Prime said, How doomed you are Autobots. You simply fail to realize that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. However, he's talking about only hundreds of Decepticons to be served by six billion humans. It is possible that he was referring to the fact that there are few Autobots while there are many Decepticons. Or it is also likely that, at this point, he considered humans to be only slaves, and thus property. Not worthy of status as equals. This quote, is in direct opposition to the same quote by Leonard Nimoy's famous character Spock from Star Trek, who was the original speaker of the quote, before his death literally. 
However, Spock's death in that movie was to save others, not at their expense. In the beginning, it shows John F. Kennedy planning The Man on the Moon, which was in 1969. Richard M. Nixon was the president of USA when Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon and Kennedy was assassinated in 1963. He couldn't have been there. O.R. Oh, he's a six-year zombie. In reality, Kennedy actually did intend to put a man on the moon, and the bit in this movie where he expresses as much takes place in 1961. Decepticons have an interesting idea of strategy as they seem to devote a large portion of their troops for decades to a strategy which hinges upon a mythical item that only the fallen from the previous movie seems to know about. The Matrix, an item they are not even looking for until 2009, between 50 and thousands of years after they implement the strategy. Meanwhile, their core elite and commanders are being wiped out over the course of these years. It is a good thing real-world military don't try this rather chronologically backward strategy. It's possible that the Decepticons did know about this, but used the Fallen as a plan B. This would make sense. If they were going to use the Allspark to build an army for labor force in the first film, and had the cube destroyed, they had to go with a plan B. If the Fallen's plan failed, they would take it to their advantage and use the Matrix to revive Sentinel and fulfill the original plan with a few edits made during the second and third film. Laserbeak did not use guns to shoot down Sam Witwicky the same way he did with Alexei Voshkid, even with perfect opportunity. The possibility of bringing him in for interrogation falls into place. But not the second time when Sam came in to threaten Dylan to release Carly. Laserbeak probably wanted to prolong Sam's knowledge that he would die, plus dishearten Carly who had just arrived. Besides, Firing a gun attached to your physical anatomy in a confined space would most likely cause the shot to go astray, possibly hitting Dylan. Why didn't Nest go underwater just like Navy SEALs? If the Nest soldiers aren't good at diving, at least they can get an underwater vehicle to ship them into the city. Availability may be an issue but still remains unclear in media. Lack of the existence of such a vehicle is probably the reason they didn't use that route. The seals were probably airdropped with a zodiac far out on Lake Michigan and moved closer until they could swim in. Another consideration is that seal teams are small. Eight men is standard, compared to Lennox's Osprey-born force, which considering the number of planes used probably originally numbered somewhere closer to 150 or 200, assuming all of them were loaded with troops instead of some of them being decoys. Sam's fight with Starscream leaves many questions. Why couldn't Starscream pull out the grapple glove with his strength? Starscream's fingers were too thick to grab such a small fin rope. Why was Sam's shooting of the hook so accurate even though Starscream was moving? Starscream wasn't moving. Instead, he stands still waiting Sam to attack, only for the grapple glove's dart get stuck in his optic. Why didn't Starscream see the grappling hook Sam was carrying? Starscream saw the grapple glove but decided to underestimate Sam by waiting the latter make his move without expecting a dart to a rope be shot in his optic. Why didn't Starscream kill Sam immediately? Starscream was having fun chasing Sam down, to the point of wanting to torment him before killing him, resulting in Sam fighting back at the end. Why wasn't Sam afraid of Starscream? Sam was afraid, but after Starscream remarked cruelly that he thought the former was working for them, Sam got angry to the point he decided not to run anymore and fight back. Why did Sam and Carly even enter the bus Starscream flipped over? They went inside while trying to hide, but it didn't work as Starscream remarked, You can't hide, boy. Why does the hook and boomstick not come out even though Starscream banged his head on the floor? They were stuck too tight on his optics to come out by doing it so. Why was Lennox strong enough to pull Starscream down to his knees? He wasn't. Starscream kneeled on purpose in his attempt to remove the devices from his optics by banging the head on the floor. Why did Starscream's boosters malfunction and how did Starscream fly up in the end without his boosters malfunctioning? His booster probably worked correctly when he isn't panicking, which is what he was felling at the moment because of his blindness. It might have worked at that moment because he used the malfunction to his favor and get up to the rooftop of the building. With the violence of Starscream's motion, 
How did Sam avoid broken torso, neck, bones or limbs or simply death? Sam was lucky Starscream didn't hit him on any surface or wall with such strength to be killed by the impact or his arm simply detach from the body. Why Starscream screams, my eye, twice, despite the fact that they're called optics? Starscream was panicking because of the pain in his optic. Why doesn't Optimus Prime just use his blade to cut off the cables when he is tangled? Possibly because he was tangled in the cables and unable to reach the blade to cut the cables. Carly's clothes have got dirty because of her running through the ruined streets. However, they are too clean after the final battle. Where did Nest get the bomb sticks from? K only gave those to Epp's team and he was captured and killed before he could give out any more. Nest soldiers might already have been in possession or Epps may have passed them over. But the issue is completely unexplored on screen leaving an inconsistency in question. The military has been in possession of sticky bombs for ages. Problem solved. When the Autobots are scouting a route through Chicago, in the long shot of their driving, two camera vehicles can be seen. If Cybertron is above the Earth, the gravity should cause various phenomena such as extreme tides, volcanic activity, and earthquakes as shown in the Transformers episode, The Ultimate Doom, Part 2. Given that this depiction of Cybertron is, uniquely, larger than Earth, these disturbances should be more extreme than those seen in Generation 1 cartoon. Maybe they just didn't want to make another 2012 CGI again. Remember when Sentinel said that the pillars defy, laws of physics. One theory could be that an object mid-trans warp has no mass. As long as the main pillar is still online, the same rule applies. This could explain why Cybertron didn't implode during the main Pilar's first disconnection, but did when Bumblebee destroyed it. Several times when the sky is in view, Cybertron isn't there, despite being seen as far as the human's operations base. This is best seen when Sentinel Prime is ripping off Optimus Prime's arm. When Cybertron is still being transported, it is behind some blue energy, meaning it may still not be physically there. Besides, Heavy winds start to pick up during the battle, meaning some effect is taking place. In the final battle, the Autobots are in three groups. Bumblebee, Ratchet, Sideswipe, Mirage and Wheeljack are captured. The Wreckers are trying to free Optimus from the crane's wires. And Wheelie and Brains are, piloting, a Decepticon ship. If at least 20 protoforms were holding Bumblebee and the others captive, and the other Autobots weren't fighting any Decepticons at all, what were the Decepticons doing the entire time? No humans to kill, no Autobots in sight. Where were they and what were they doing? The Decepticons were most likely trying to find the other Autobots, Wreckers and Optimus, or trying to kill any of the three human teams, Seals, Epps, or Lennox, when the Autobots arrive on the battlefield. In the first shot where Ratchet is in humanoid mode saying, Mortar that bridge, his vehicle mode can be seen in the back in the following shot with Sam and Carly. Why didn't Optimus Prime just didn't use his jetpack mode to destroy the Decepticon ships after destroying Shockwave's pet driller? He got trapped in the building after being shot by Shockwave, and wanted to make his triumphal entrance to kill him.